Um, yeah. Um, good morning. I declare open the public briefing for the committee's inquiry into births, deaths and marriages and registration <coughs> bill. My name is Peter Russo, member for two and chair of the committee. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. We're very fortunate to live in a country with two of the oldest continuing cultures and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose lands, winds and waters we all share. Uh, with me today are Laura Gerber, Member for Corumban and Deputy Chair, Sandy Bolton, Member for Noosa via teleconference, John T. Bush, Member for Cooper, Kim Richards, MP, Member for Redlands, who is substituting for Jason Hunt, Member for Caloundra, and John Crowsey, Member for the Scenic Rim. The purpose of today's briefing is to assist the committee with its examination of the bill which was introduced in the Queensland Parliament on the 2nd of December 2022 and referred to the Committee for Consideration. Only the Committee and invited witnesses may participate in the proceedings. Witnesses are not required to give evidence on their oath, but I remind witnesses that intentionally misleading the Committee is a serious offence. These proceedings are similar to Parliament and are subject to the legislative assembly standing rules and orders. In this regard, I remind members of the public that under the standing orders, the public may be admitted to or excluded from the briefing at the discretion of the committee. I also remind committee members that departmental officers are here to provide factual and technical information. Any questions about an opinion about policy should be directed to the Attorney General or left to the debate on the floor of the House. These proceedings are being recorded by Hansard and broadcast live on the Parliament's website. Media may be present and are subject to the committee's media rules and my directions at all times. You may be filmed or photographed during the proceedings and images may also appear on the Parliament's website or social media pages. I ask everyone present to turn your mobile phones off to silent mode. And what time will we finish? 11.27. Yeah, so we're due to finish at 11.25. I hope that doesn't inconvenience anyone. Um, okay, um, Laura, are you? Oh, oh sorry. Are they going to give an opening statement? Or do you want to go I left out a page. <laughs> sorry. Um, I now welcome witnesses from the Department of Justice and Attorney General who briefed the committee on the bill. Um, Greg Berg, Director of Strategic um, Policy, and Leanne Robinson, Assistant Director General of Strategic Policy and Legal Services. Um, for the benefit of Hansard, could you please identify yourself when you first speak? Um, I now I, I invite you to brief the committee after which the committee members will have some uh, questions for you. Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Leanne Robertson from DJAG. Um, firstly, I too would like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and to pay my respects to Elders past pres and present. So the bill, the Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Bill 2022, repeals and makes the existing Births, Deaths and Marriages Act uh, and remakes the existing Act. Mm -hmm. So while the bill includes a number of changes, the most extensive occur in Part 5. Part 5 establishes a new legislative framework to strengthen the legal recognition of trans and gender diverse individuals, which is largely consistent with the approaches taken in Victoria and Tasmania. Queensland is one of only three remaining Australian jurisdictions to have not yet progressed reforms to improve the legal recognition of trans and gender diverse people in this area. Several countries around the world have also adopted models of gender recognition based on principles of self-determination, including Argentina, Denmark, Colombia, Ireland, Malta, Norway, Belgium, Brazil, Luxembourg, Pakistan, Portugal, Uruguay, Chile, Iceland, Switzerland and New Zealand. The point that I'm want to make here is twofold. Firstly, that Queensland is not alone in making these changes. And secondly, that in every jurisdiction that has introduced similar reforms in Australia, the evidence indicates the system is working as intended. So, Chair, I just thought I'd use this opportunity to provide some contextual background to the approach taken in the bill and the foundational policy that sits under the framework of Part 5 itself. The submissions opposed to the framework start from a position that sex is separate and distinct from gender. However, the bill itself adopts a broad, inclusive approach to what constitutes a person's sex, including that it should take account of the gender identity of a person. 
In doing so, it conflates the concepts of sex and gender. This is also consistent with how the law already treats the terms sex and gender. The legal understanding of these terms needs to be divorced from a scientific perspective. And I note that similar comments were made from, uh, by representatives from Equality Australia at the public hearing last week. So collapsing the terms sex and gender is consistent with the approach advanced by the Queensland Human Rights Commission in its report, Building Belonging, Review of Queensland's Anti-Discrimination Act, the approach of other Australian jurisdictions that have made changes in this area, and the way that the courts and the common law have evolved over time. The approach taken acknowledges that sex, as it is recorded on birth certificates, is a social marker of identity, not simply a marker of biology. In this way, the bill reflects changing expectations of being able to accurately describe a personal identity beyond a rigid demarcation of two binary sexes. So I also thought I'd use this opportunity to clarify a couple of other matters coming out of the hearings. To be clear, the bill does not propose any changes to the way the registry of births, deaths and marriages collect or record sex information at birth. Sex is recorded on the register at the time of a child's birth and this information is provided by way of a notification of birth to the registry and subsequent birth registration application by the parents. If a person alters their record of sex at a later point in their life, the record of the person's sex at birth is not deleted from the register. A number of submissions have raised concerns that the introduction of pathways that will enable children to alter their record of sex will lead to the medicalisation of gender questioning children. Gender affirmation does not automatically mean that a person will undergo medical intervention. While some trans and gender diverse persons, including children, may view medical procedures as necessary to their well-being and the only path to their gender identity realisation, the department understands this necessity is not felt by the entire transgender community. The contention in submissions that the Bill of Past will fast-track the medicalisation of children with respect misstates the purpose of the Bill. Some submitters at the public hearing raised the need for an audit of Queensland legislation. I wish to provide some context to the audits which have taken place in other Australian jurisdictions and in particular their timing. In Tasmania, the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute produced an audit of Tasmanian legislation in June 2020, nine months after amendments to Tasmania's birth certificate laws commenced. Passage of legal gender recognition legislation in the ACT occurred in 2014. It wasn't until 2019 that the ACT government commissioned Equality Australia to conduct an independent and comprehensive legal audit of ACT legislation and regulations. The bill, as you note, com commences by proclamation. This acknowledges that there are a range of implementation activities which will need to be undertaken. The department notes that it's, it's intended that individual agencies will consider their own portfolio legislation to determine whether changes are required because of the bill. Any resulting amendments are a matter of each agency to manage. So, Chair, thank you again for the opportunity this morning to address the committee, and we're happy to take questions. Oh, thank you. Um, Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to start with something that's um, come up a fair bit during the committee process and the hearings, yes. and I'm interested to know whether or not DJAG has found any evidence of men identifying as women entering women's spaces or entering women's spaces and committing an offence in any jurisdiction and how much investigation has DJAG done in relation to any of those occurrences? Thank you for the question. I realise it's big and yep. Yep. If, you, if you need some time or yep. if, you, if you want to come back at the end of the hearing, you can do that as well. So um, uh, the departmental response to submissions did canvas the range of research that the department did consider from Scotland New Zealand, Tasmania, Western Australia, as well as um, some expert evidence given by the UN independent expert on the protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So Scotland did a, an extensive piece of work, including considering a range of literature and did not find any evidence supporting a link between women only spaces being inclusive of transgender women and cisgender men falsely claiming a trans identity to access those spaces. Um, the New Zealand uh, Department of Internal Affairs did 
uh, an extensive uh, consideration as part of their reforms that were passed in 2021 and found no evidence to suggest that self-identification processes would lead to more predatory men entering women's facilities. The UN independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination concludes that in countries that have legal recognition based on self-identification, there is no credible evidence to suggest systemic risk of predatory men using the process of identifying and living as a woman as an opportunity to per perpetrate gender or sexual based violence. And further noted that the human rights of trans women are not dependent on the hypothetical risk that predatory men could disguise themselves as such and perpetrate crime. And that in democratic societies, the possibility of abuse of rights must be foreseen and addressed through appropriate evidence-based preventative mechanisms, which do not include the arbitrary obstacles to the legal recognition of gender identity. So there was analysis undertaken. You've also got the reviews undertaken by the Western Australian Law Reform Commission and the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute. The, the, these issues are ventilated when these reforms are considered, and those law reform bodies concluded that there was no particular evidence to indicate uh, the, that particular risk forthcoming. And the, T, the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute particularly had the benefit of considering the reforms sort of post uh, post the actual commencement and, and didn't identify any particular evidence of misuse and, and did consider that women's spaces issue. So we have looked to the evidence that uh, we could identify and, and determined um, e equally that, and I think New Zealand uh, make this comment, that the, the birth certificate isn't, uh, it overstates the use of the birth certificate in entering particular spaces, whether it be bathrooms or whatever it might be, and that the, the link to actually falsifying it on the birth certificate and men entering those spaces is not a link that's been established. So I, I, hope, I think that's probably as far as I could take it. Mm, okay. Uh, if I might continue. Yes. Yeah, is that okay, Chair? Thank you. Uh, another issue that arose during the public <coughs> hearings was in relation to same-sex schools and a concern that this bill will override the current exemption that's in place um, in relation to same-sex schools, and I'm just, I just need the department's response in relation to that. Um, I'm not sure if you, have, you were present for the oral submission in relation to the Catholic diocese. They were... Oh, the Christian schools? The Christian schools, yes, yes sorry. Yeah. Um, so the Associated Christian schools, sorry, yes. So I, th I think uh, at the outset in acknowledging anything within the context of the Anti-Discrimination Act, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that we do have the building belonging report that has been published and makes 122 recommendations uh, for categories of reform to Queensland's discrimination law. Um, and the government has published an interim response and a, a more detailed, fulsome response is forthcoming. Um, equally, as part of uh, our written response, we did refer to the Queensland Human Rights Commission's Transit School Guide in terms of um, how they engage in the issue. And in building belonging, the QHRC, the, uh, the gatekeepers of the Anti-Discrimination Act, do make clear that they take a beneficial interpretation to sex already, where sex to them does mean both that biological sex at birth and then the sex in accordance with a person's gender identity. And in fact, the Transit School Guide acknowledges um, uh, that... Uh, that uh, Sorry, Mr. Can I just bring you back to the substance of my question? Will, will it override the current... So will this bill override what's currently in place? Can you talk us through what it will change in terms of well, the current... Ex the cu so schools can currently... They don't have to make an application. They can... The current exemptions under the Human Rights and anti sorry, Anti-Discrimination Act... Does this bill override that? That was essentially the crux of what was unknown. Well, I guess I'm giving context to the way the QHRC already interpret the exemption, that they read sex beneficially already to be inclusive uh, in, in, in the way in which it, and it, it publish a guide. So well, what, do, what does the bill do, Mr Burke? Yeah, don't interrupt him, please. Just well, him we've asked the question twice yeah, already, Joe. No, just let him finish. And if you want to follow up, you ask after that. Well, the bill has an effect provision that provides uh, once a, a child's sex as altered, they're taken to be that sex for the purposes of but subject to all Queensland laws. But I think that has to be read in conjunction with the way the QHRC already interprets the single sex exemption as published in its guide as they work when there are complaints. They, they interpret sex beneficially as an attribute already under the Act. So it, but this it, enshrines it in legislation and it's, it's different. It does create a difference. 
the, the effect provision solidifies it, yes. Um, but uh, if, if a matter went to them already, they're already very clear on the record about how they interpret the sex protected attribute under the Act. I guess the effect provision kind of, yes, it reinforces that interpretation they're already applying and the way in which uh, a trans student can access a, a single sex school. Um, can I just bring up something before we sure. move on? Um, there was evidence, I don't know if you had the opportunity to hear it or, or uh, read it from uh, um, Carinity College um, at the hearing last week. Mm. Uh, we saw, yeah, we, we... Yeah, could, are you able to expand on their concerns? Mm. I mean, it's an individual matter for, for each particular school. I think yeah. that their concerns were about a particular male-bodied yeah. um, students coming within a school. So there's obviously remit within the Anti-Discrimination Act to seek particular exemptions. Um, but I, I would refer to the way in which the current exemption is interpreted right. in the way that it is uh, all, all, already the guidance provided by the QHRC is that it is inclusive of trans trans students. and that's how they would conciliate a complaint today. Mm. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to go to Sandy unless you've got a follow-up. I do have a follow-up. I've up. got lots yeah. of... Um, and then I'm going to Sandy. Okay, sure. Mr Burke, the evidence that we heard from, I think it was the Associated Christian Schools, was that at the moment they understand they have an exemption from elements of the anti-discrimination laws in Queensland at the point of enrolment and um, they expressed concerns about the changes being brought in this bill and whether that would be maintained or if they would be required to apply in the future for another exemption to the QHRC or to whatever authority they need to apply to. As um, you know, you're here briefing us about this bill, can you um, tell the committee whether or not um, the exemption that is presently, as we have heard from uh, the Associated Christian Schools, is uh, presently uh, there in place at the point of enrolment, will that be maintained into the future under this bill or is that situation changing? Well, I think, uh, and I noted this, the building belonging is the blueprint for a future anti-discrimination act. Um, no, don't go to that report, please. I, wanna, I want you to answer what's in this bill before us today. I, I think I, I took it as far as I could in the previous question where we know how the Queensland Human Rights Commission interpret the exemption. I appreciate Carinity and the Associated Christian Schools may, may take an alternative view and see, see sex more biologically centric, but we have clear guidance from the Queensland Human Rights Commission as to how they interpret the single sex exemption already and they have a conciliation process and manage matters. The effect provision further solidifies that. So if a child altered their record of sex for the purposes but subject to Queensland laws, they would be of that sex. Um, so the, the bill solidifies the approach that the, and the Human Rights Commission already takes if, if it was ever involved in matters in determining that single sex exemption. So was the evidence that the Associated Christian Schools gave us that they do enjoy at the moment an exemption at the point of enrolment, was that incorrect? They do enjoy an exemption at the point of enrolment. Mm -hmm. Their interpretation of it, if challenged uh, before the Human Rights Commission, may, may be a matter for conciliation. But I, I guess ultimately that they're, they're enjoying the, the way that they interpret the exemption to be, or we're going, we're providing evidence to the fact as to how the Human Rights Commission uh, give guidance to schools about the extent of what the exemption protects at the moment. So to be subject to challenge, perhaps in the future. But it, 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 I can't preempt that, but it may well be. Mm. And again, the Anti Discrimination Act is in a state of flux. I, I think you can. Well, I appreciate you, your question was to not focus on that. We have to be alive to the fact we have 122 recommendations, and that Anti Discrimination Act is quite an old act, um, and will be has has had an extensive review by the Queensland Human Rights Commission, where they solidify their interpretation of sex in that report. <laughs> in terms of the way they beneficially interpret it and ask for that to be further enshrined in the new Anti-Discrimination Act. So more to come. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think all of those issues, you know, will be uh, worked through. And in the and they make a clear recommendation in their report that a new anti discrimination act needs to be mindful and interact mm -hmm. cohesively with the birth, deaths, and marriages uh, registration um, act as it's as it's going forth now. And when they were developing their report, they were aware work was happening in the birth certificate space, but it hadn't actually been introduced or considered by Parliament. So they were mindful of that interaction needing, needing to work cohesively. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Um, can I go to Sandy and then I'll come back to you? Sure. Sandy? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. A um, couple of quick ones. Um, Greg, look, uh, the Queensland Law Society reported in their submission that previous drafts of the bill had different concepts of gender and sex. Can I ask why was that changed for this bill? So, Yes, the, 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 throughout consultation drafts and every drafting of a bill is a journey and you, you evolve and you develop your understanding and thinking. And I think our written response acknowledges that we've had regard to that kind of multifactorial understanding of sex as the High Court have, have enumerated it, as the Queensland Human Rights Commission have enumerated it in building belonging, um, particularly uh, uh, stakeholders raise with us as part of that uh, a phase during the development of the bill that a distinction between biological sex and affirmed gender could actually propagate a culture of discrimination against trans and gender diverse people and that would actually be used as a tool to exclude or otherwise reduce the rights and that much of the trans exclusionary advocacy efforts fundamentally align to that distinction to erode rights it would also create a, a, a two-tier system between those that undergo sexual reassignment surgery and those who have not. And I think it's important to acknowledge would be inconsistent largely with the way every other Australian jurisdiction has managed um, these reforms. So you look to both Victoria and the ACT, there's a framed quite similarly to the bill as introduced that a person alters their record of sex. Northern Territory and South Australia uh, both acknowledge a change of sex or gender and kind of leave the issue a tad unresolved. Tasmania do it a little bit differently, and I know some discussions have been had about the Tasmanian reforms. So the Tasmanians uh, require a sex to be recorded at birth, but then for a person to register a gender at a later point in life. However, they have an interpretive pr pr uh, provision in their act that largely then brings them back together. So essentially, once a person registers a gender in accordance with their framework, uh, that's taken to be their sex for the purposes of all other references throughout the Tasmanian law. So while it separates at the start, it largely brings it back together at the end. So the net effect of that is, is essentially that is then taken to be their sex across other Tasmanian laws. So we, we, we had a look at those jurisdictions as well. And, and ultimately, you know, uh, while a matter for government, the, the, the bill as introduced reflects an approach that frames it as an alteration of the record of sex. Okay, so going back to stakeholders, we heard at the public hearing uh, that you know this that consultation had been undertaken for many years. Um, can I obtain like how has the community, local community groups, even MPs, how they were informed or engaged besides when we were presented with this bill prior to that? And that can be taken on notice as to when there was notifications regarding. Well, I think it's worth acknowledging throughout 20, remember throughout 2018 and 19, there was a series of three discussion papers released on the review of the Birth, Deaths and Marriages Act. Um, and the first discussion paper extensively canvassed uh, legal recognition opportunities for trans and gender diverse people. And that was open to the entire community. This review, review has been a long standing one. So there, there was a significant volume. And I think that's reflected in some of the written material uh, yes, we've, we've already provided. Yeah, I appreciate that. However, I just would like to know when MPs, who are obviously a stakeholder on behalf of their community, when they were notified, um, going back even in 2018 and 2019. So it's just, you know, it can be taken on notice because I would appreciate that. Um, and lastly, um, at the moment, there's obviously a review going on in the UK um, regarding Scottish implementation of similar laws. Um, are you aware of uh, a report called the Tavistock, which, um, and I couldn't quite clearly hear our previous witness, but ha is the um, 
uh, VJAG aware of that report and the impacts to children that it refers to? So, Chair, there's a couple of questions yeah, that Ms Bond's raised. Perhaps. Sandy, can I just ask you, um, out of respect to the people that are having to answer your questions, can you just do one at a time? I'll give you the opportunity to, to ask follow-up. So if we could Wonderful. So dealing with the first question, which I think was about, if, um, Ms Bolton, if I've got this correct, please correct me, it's Leanne Robertson, um, that basically at what time were NPs advised in relation to the reform um, so as Mr Burke has outlined, those 2018 and 2019 discussion papers were public consultation processes at that point. And then obviously, um, uh, you know, a government uh, considered the feedback in relation to those, then of course worked through proposals um, and uh, had some targeted consultation with stakeholders, not MPs, I acknowledge that. Obviously, um, what ministers, government ministers do and what members of government do is a matter for them. I can't comment on that. And then, of course, the bill introduced and now we have the parliamentary committee process. I, I can't, uh, Ms Bolton, indicate what ministers of government might have done um, in, the pro in the process of development more generally. But that's the, that's the, the public pr consultation process and the processes that we understand it to be. I might turn to my colleague to see if he can actually address the technical question, but if he can't, we'll, we will take that on notice. Do you I mean, need it? Is this about the Tavistock report, yeah. member? Yep. I mean, the department is aware and monitors those international developments, and um, I think that goes to some of the uh, submitters that raised issues around gender questioning children and the approach for handling that. Obviously, within Queensland, we have the Queensland Children's Hospital Gender Clinic and Gender Service um, that, that provide that, that support. Uh, and, uh, you know, the numbers have been increasing for that service and that has been reported um, in the media. Obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the impact of that report on, you know, the, the management and treatment of gender diverse kids would be outside our portfolio responsibilities. But, um, you know, we are aware of that Tavistock inquiry. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just go to John and back to you, Laura? Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Leanne and Greg. Thank you um, particularly for your written response, which I, I found quite um, useful for some of the questions that I had. Um, one of the outstanding questions I did have, though, was um, in relation to issues raised, I think, by Multicultural Australia around having people having to wait 12 months of residency before they can make an application. Just wanting to understand the rationale behind that a little bit more and... Um, No, you're fine. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it is worth acknowledging that uh, the registry applies a 12-month residency requirement at a practical level now under the requirement that someone be ordinarily resident. So it's largely moving what is set at a policy level into a legislative requirement that is broadly consistent with all other jurisdictions, noting that some take it further and actually require permanent residency or Australian citizenship. The, the, the essentially, the, the basis of it is, is to require that connection um, to Queensland so that uh, the, the, there are some uh, sort of attachments to the jurisdiction before they seek that change of name and to limit opportunities for a person to create multiple identities in different places. Of course, there's exceptions built in. Um, one of them being an, an exceptional circumstances determination by the registrar and, and that that would have capacity to consider the individual case-by-case -case circumstances of, an hum, of a humanitarian entrant and the basis of, of what that might be. So, of course, the registry would consider those each on an individualised basis. But I guess it was really elevating what was applied practically into a legislative requirement and is, is quite consistent with most other jurisdictions that do set that 12-month residency requirement. But I think the exceptions are important yeah. to be able to balance the kind of competing interests there. Yeah, I think it was certainly the humanitarian um, Ellen, issue that, yeah. that piqued my interest. So I guess the only way you could strengthen that would be to work that in as an explicit example in... Uh, I mean, and, and I guess uh, that would be more covered by the regard to is 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 their is their matter exceptional? Mm. Uh, you know, the potential trauma or w mm. whatever it might be that the humanitarian entrant is perhaps mm. coming for on the basis of their request, and that the registry would be able to determine that on each individual instance. No one else has an explicit yeah. sort of humanitarian yeah. entrant exception. Yeah. So I think 
and I know uh, in a couple of instances, Multicultural Australia has called for like explicit, explicit. examples, mm. and that that's not really consistent with how other jurisdictions. But you sort of got the capacity within the existing limbs or exceptions that we do have to have regard to that matrix of mm. circumstances mm. that a person might be might be under. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Laura. Thank you, Chair. I have a question around the operation of this Act towards in relation to children, but before I do, I just wanted to seek a point of clarification in relation to the timeline mm -hmm. that you just gave Leanne around consultation. That timeline um, s seemed to indicate that the bill had been consulted on since 2018. I just wanted a point of clarification. Oh, sorry, if I've... Substantially different. Yeah, if I've created that impression, I apologise. No, um, so discussion papers or issues papers, I guess, for where particular questions were posited, um, were put out in the public arena. The consultation on the draft bill um, didn't actually occur an, until this, uh, sorry, 2022 with targeted stakeholders. That was the process. So I apologise if I created... What was the date in 2022? So so there was a roundtable uh, in October 2021 on sort of policy proposals as been refined and then consultation on a, on a bill in and I just um, want to... May and June 2022. On a bill, but not this bill. Uh, no, the, obviously the changes are made responding to stakeholder feedback, yes. Yeah, that's the, the clarity I was seeking. Thank yeah, you. Sorry, <laughs> I apologise if I gave the wrong impression. Yeah, that's all right. Just in relation to the application of this bill to children, mm -hmm. uh, there has been a lot of submitters that are concerned, and I want to know from the department what is the process, what, what process does this bill propose for a child to change their sex marker from the, if they're between the ages of 12 and 16, and then between the ages of 16 and 18, and specifically talking about whether or not parental consent is required, specifically looking at um, the processes that the child would have to undergo as proposed by the bill. So I might start with the 16 and 17 year olds, if, if yep. If, yep so. uh, 16 to 18, I said, so is, is, it seven, is it 16 to 17? Yes, yeah, so an 18 year old would be treated uh, under the adult framework. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so 16, 16 17. and 17 year olds are essentially positioned within the framework that, a, that an, uh, an adult would apply under. Okay. So a 16 year old, no parental consent required, would be able to make an application under part five to alter their record of sex with a stat declaration from them accompanied by the supporting statement from an adult who's known them for 12 months or longer. So that would be the pathway for 16 and 17 year olds. That's consistent with both Tasmania and the ACT that have opened that up to 16 and above. Um, uh, then your 12 to 15 year olds. Um, so uh, you could have uh, both parents making the application together. Um, you, there are specific scenarios contemplated in the bill where one parent would be able to apply directly to the registrar. Even For example, if the other parent disagrees. Well, so the, the scenarios are particularly where Seems the other parent has passed, you're the only parent on the birth certificate, mm -hmm. or you have an order from the family court which mm -hmm. provides you with sole parental responsibility. So that's in relation to major long-term decisions for the child. So if that order's in place granting you that sole parental responsibility, you'd have a straight pathway to the registrar. There's also uh, a provision, provisions in the bill that provide for a dispensation framework, so uh, whereby uh, you could go to the children's court as a prelim preliminary matter, um, wh whereby... When you say you, sorry, are you referring oh, the to parent, the parent, the, the parent. The parent would be able to go to the children's court as a preliminary matter, the supportive parent, mm -hmm. so you might have a supportive parent. Um, and they could seek a dispensation order that would dispense with the other parent's consent. That might be where you've made all reasonable inquiries to contact mm -hmm. them and you just can't. Um, it might be where the child was uh, a product of uh, or was the result of, an, of a sexual offence or it might be otherwise where it's in the child's best interest to dispense with the other parent's consent and the children's court would have the scope to consider that and there might be a range of psychological harmful reasons that that might be there. So if you've got that dispensation order as the supportive parent, you would uh, move away from the court process and then go back to the registry. Any application to the registry needs to be accompanied by a assessment by a developmentally informed practitioner. So we specifically prescribe under the draft regulation who the developmentally informed practitioners may be. Um, and that captures a broad range of supports that may meet a child depending on where their transition journey is from psychiatrists to counsellors to guidance officers um, to a speech pathologist. There's, there's a broad range of supports. 
Um, but that essentially, that assessment is a determination or assessment by that practitioner that the child understands the meaning and legal implications of the alteration. Um, Twelve year old child. Okay. Absolutely, yes. I mean, and, and we, you know, we have evidence that children can feel this deeply um, at, at mm. earlier ages. Um, what the bill then also, so, so uh, essentially uh, that safeguard applies to any application to the registry. You need to provide that assessment. So those are all the ways in which you can get direct to the registry. You then have uh, a scenario where there may be a supportive parent and a non-supportive parent um, and the dispensation framework isn't open to you. That matter would be a contested matter before the Children's Court, where the Children's Court has the determination to make an order directing the registrar to accept the application if they consider it to be in the best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. So that could be taken by a supportive parent. And then the final component is the one that, uh, again, the ACT uh, have, have provided for recently in legislative amendments that they put forward. And, uh, we had regard to that is a 12 to 15 year old would be able to navigate if they have a, a go to the children's court on their own where there are no supportive parents or persons with parental responsibility to seek an order um, to uh, uh, from the court to order the registrar to alter their record of sex. And the ACT is the only jurisdiction that's done this? Uh, yeah, the ACT did reforms back in uh, 2020 that established those kind of different differing pathways. So it's obviously... Uh, yeah, they're, they're the only jurisdiction that's specifically moved there. Um, obviously, we're not envisaging that is going to be a huge number of kids, and um, it, it, it's 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 a significant process mm. to undertake that. And um, uh, we're in conversations with Legal Aid Queensland and other legal service providers, and through implementation, would make sure there's appropriate referrals and pathways and supports for a child that might take on that process. Mm. Um, as part of about parents, you're in consultation with parents. We we had a session with a parent support group. Yes, indeed. And um, uh, assumedly, parents would play a role within the children's court process. So the, the, there is um, a capacity for the child, 12 to 15, to make a submission to the court uh, that they would be so adversely affected that the application shouldn't be served on the parents, and and the and the court makes that determination. And there are a range of factors for them to have regard to. Um, in that space, um, and the child is able to make a submission to that effect, and it might be because potentially the, the violence or whatever it might be that that child's particularly um, may have suffered. So there's scope for the child to make that submission, and if the court determines that they would be adversely affected,